Are renewables the end of modern civilization? Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. I put a poll to the viewers and I asked you what I should discuss today. There were two articles or papers I wanted to go through. The first is one dealing with energy and the second is one from the RBA looking at crypto. And 73% of you voted on energy. Now, this is a paper I looked at some time ago. And frankly, I think we really need to go through through the whole thing. There are some terms here that we need to understand. There's uh, images that I want to start bringing into my slide deck to refer to. And, well, here in Queensland, in my own state, we have a new project happening. And, you know, the new... Well, renewable, variable renewable energy push here in Queensland. It's going to solve all our problems. And this image here is just one of the proposed hydro batteries or pump hydro reservoirs. Now, it's interesting because you've got to realize this here, it's not necessary at all. The reason we need this is because variable renewable energy is just that. It's variable. We don't have control over it regardless of how much we sacrifice to Greta, the wind god won't bless us with the winds. So, Or the sun god may say, nope, it's nighty night time every night. So we need this, this infrastructure here, which, well, has an embodied energy component to it, which will displace a lot of people's homes, which will damage the natural environment because you can't drink this water. You've got to use it for the battery pack. This is just storage of energy. And, it, and I think it only lasts... They're estimating one day, but still. Where right now, with our current energy production technology, with the traditional stuff, and I'll bring up a website so we can have a look at energy production, the energy market right now. Right now, at the time that I'm recording, we can see here how much of our energy is coming. You know, a whole lot from brown coal now. A little bit from solar. Rooftop solar up there, which is good, but most of it from coal, renewables, and... Uh, bit from wind, but yeah, most of it is coming from, well, power stations, fossil fuels. And these ones here, the solar farms, they're all dropping down in power. The wind farms, 17%, they're getting lower and lower and lower. Right now, our storage for long-term power is in the ground. It's coal or it's gas. That's our battery system. That's what you can deploy if the wind stops working. So you don't need to build this type of infrastructure. Now, the cost, the energy requirements, the embodied energy, the embodied carbon in a project like this needs to be considered in the true full cost of electricity and energy. And that's why this paper brings a few interesting topics to light. Because, well, frankly, the full cost of energy isn't being assessed properly. This is written by Lars, um, Lars Schoenakal, William Smith, and Rosemary Falcon. And it's from, uh, what is it, the Canadian Centre of Science and Education, and an accepted manuscript for publication at the Journal of Management and Sustainability, Volume 12, Number 1, Ju- June 2022. So grab yourself a coffee. I've got my Stein, and I also have, have a water. And we'll go through this paper and let me know if you've learned something new through this. Because honestly, I I get the feeling that our powers that be aren't being very thorough in their decision-making process and the methodology that they're using. And they're just chasing the sound bites. The average punter has no idea about the idea of embodied energy or embodied carbon. They've got no idea about the fact that you need to re-energize your infrastructure which is a whole lot of additional embodied energy and embodied carbon. They don't even understand the concept of, of uh, opportunity cost. And these are all terms that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and we'll, we'll look at them if we need to. But, I mean, let's just have a look here. Here's the one thing. I mean, here, this is good. Oh, we've got a few in yellow. Green is bad in this chart, okay? Green means they're not running at full, full utilization. Now, these wind ter- farms down in Victoria, which I keep picking on, But the reason is they need to meet a certain output over their lifetime to actually have a net benefit. 
because there's a whole bunch of embodied energy in these things, embodied carbon, transportation costs, and you're bu- you know, and, and even land clearing. And you're building a whole lot of these things all dispersed around the state where, I mean, what's that producing? Uh, 28% of its output, uh, 29%. 29%, 10% of its output, where you've got you know these coal plants here producing 115% of its output and 357. There's less land clearing there. That all needs to be taken into account. So grab yourself a coffee. Let's sit down and we'll have a look at this paper. And we'll start with the, well, First off, let's have a look at a few keyword uh, abbreviations. So CCUS is the Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage. EROI is the Energy Return in Energy Invested. VRE is Variable Renewable Energy, such as wind and solar. And that's what we need to call renewable energy. It needs to be referred to as VREs because it is variable. It's not dependent. They, they will only market the output capacity not the actual production. Those are two different things. HELI is a high efficiency, low emission. IEA is the International Energy Agency in Paris. Full cost of electricity is FCOE. Levelized cost of electricity, LCOE, and these are two different things. PS is the primary energy supply, or PE for primary energy. PV is photovoltaic. USC is ultra super uh, critical and variable renewable energy. They've Put that in twice. I wonder why. So let's start with the abstract. Understanding electricity generation's true cost is paramount to choosing and prioritizing our future energy system. This paper introduces the full cost of electricity and discusses energy returns, EROIs. The authors conclude with suggestions for energy policy considering the new challenges that come with global efforts to decarbonize. In 2021, debate started to occur regarding energy security, or rather electricity security, which was driven by an increase in electricity demand, shortage of energy raw material supply, insufficient electricity generation from wind and solar, and geopolitical challenges, which in turn resulted in high prices and volatility in major economies. This was witnessed around the world, for instance, in China, India, the US, and of course, Europe. Reliable energy supply is crucial for social and economic stability and growth, which in turn leads to eradication of poverty. And that is a statement that I'm sure we are. It should be self-evident to everyone. The cheaper and more abundant your electricity, the more well, the poverty disappears. Suddenly, you're not spending all your time washing clothes by hand in the river because you have a machine that does it for you. We explain and quantify the gap between installed energy capacity and actual electricity generation when it comes to variable renewable energy. The main challenge for wind and solar are its intermittency and low energy density. And as a result... Practically every windmill or solar panel requires either a backup or storage, which adds to system costs. Exactly, and that's what they're proposing here in Queensland. LCOE, which is the levelized cost of electricity, is inadequate to compare intermittent forms of energy generation with dispatchable ones and when making decisions at a country or society level. We introduce and describe the methodology for determining the full cost of electricity or the full cost to society. FCOE is it, uh, FCOE is full cost. Yes. FCOE explains why wind and solar are not cheaper than conventional fuels and in fact become more expensive the higher they, their penetration in energy systems. Seems like it, doesn't it? Anecdotally. How's your power bill, guys? I just paid one. It was painful. The IEA confirms the system value of variable renewables such as wind and solar decreases as their share in the power supply increases. This is illustrated by the high cost of green of the green energy transition. If it was cheaper, it would happen. Okay, the reality is, if 
all of this renewable, variable renewable energy were cheaper, the market would find a solution. It would just happen. Competition. You wouldn't need to force it like the governments are. It wouldn't need this ideology behind it. We conclude with suggestions for a revised energy policy. Energy policy and investors should not favor wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, hydro, nuclear, gas, or coal, but should support all energy systems in a manner which avoids energy shortages and energy poverty. 100%. I'm, I'm going to raise a stein to that one because that, that should be the energy policy here in Australia. It really doesn't feel like it, shouldn't it? Yeah. If, if a political party said our policy is avoiding energy shortages and eliminating energy po- poverty. All energy always requires taking resources from our planet and processing them, thus negatively impacting the environment. It must be humanity's goal to minimize these negative impacts in a meaningful way through investments, not divestments, by increasing, not decreasing energy and material efficiencies. Therefore, the authors suggest energy policy makers to refocus on three objectives, energy security, energy affordability, and environmental protection. This transition into two pa- th- sorry, this translates into two pathways for the future of energy. One, invest in education and base research to pave the way towards a new energy revolution where energy systems can, su- be, can sustainably wean off fossil fuels. Two, in parallel, energy policy must support investment in conventional energy systems to improve their efficiencies and reduce the environmental burden of generating the energy required for our lives. Additional research is required to better understand the EROI, which is the energy return on energy return on energy invested, true cost of energy, material input, and effects of current energy transition pathways on global energy security. So we've got the preface here: energy in watts per hour uh, versus power in watts. What energy? Okay, energy is the capacity to do work. Power is energy per unit of time. Thus, energy is what happens. uh, Sorry, thus, energy is what makes change happen and can be transferred from one object to another. Energy can also be transformed from one form to another. Power is the rate at which energy is transferred. Once you know both the energy storage capacity, uh, megawatt hours of a battery or milliwatt hours, and the output, you can simply divide these numbers to find how long the battery will last. Energy is stored in a Tesla battery, i.e. 100 kilowatt hours. Horsepower, let's say 150, is what moves the car forward. The battery filled with energy drains over time depending on how much power is required for moving the car, which depends on how you drive and the surrounding conditions. Okay. Capacity factor. is the percentage of power output achieved from the installed capacity at a given site usually stated on an annual basis. Capacity factor is different from the efficiency factor. For comparison, efficiency measures the percentage of input energy required, sorry, input energy transformed to usable output energy. Hmm, that's, that's a thing to consider, isn't it? How much of this energy do we need to put into this system to actually get back? In the pumped hydro example, how much energy are you using to pump water up there to get it back? I, I can just imagine, I'm, I've got this image in my head of diesel generators pumping water up here. <laughs> it's a fallback method. In Germany, photovoltaics achieves an average annual capacity factor of 10 to 11%, while California reaches an annual average capacity factor of 25%. Thus, California yields almost 2.5 times the output of an identical or two and a half times of an identical PV plant in Germany. It is important to distinguish between the average annual capacity factor and the monthly or better weekly and daily capacity factor, which is very relevant when keeping an electricity system stable that requires demand to always equal supply for the electricity frequency to remain stable. The conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics, essentially states that energy can never be created from nothing nor lost into nothing. 
only converted from one form to another. Different forms of energy include thermal, mechanical, electrical, chemical, nuclear, and radiant energy. Entropy of energy, the second law of thermodynamics, essentially distinguishes between useful energy, low entropy, that can perform work, and less useful energy, high entropy, that cannot easily perform work. Entropy is a measure of randomness, disorder, or diffusion in an energy system where greater disorder equals greater entropy. Whenever energy is converted from one form to other, there is always some fraction of useful energy that becomes useless. Entropy disorder increases. Planck said, in other words, every process occurring in nature always increases the sum of the entropies of all bodies taking part in that process. At the limit for reversible processes, the sum remains unchanged. The second law of thermodynamics thus explains why perpetual motion machines are are not possible. Thus, the more complex energy processes are, the more useful energy is lost. Okay. So let's start. Now we've got the preface preface and the abstract done. Let's start with the actual paper. Okay. Introduction. Today's global electricity systems. In 2019, fossil fuels... In order of importance, oil, coal, and gas made up 80% of global primary energy production, totaling 170 tetrawatt hours, I'm assuming, or approximately 600 EG, EJ. Despite COVID and significant wind and solar capacity additions, the percentage has not changed in 2021. Quite the contrary, coal made a comeback. Coal and gas made up 60% of global gross electricity production totaling 28.4 tetrawatt hours in 2021. It is important to note that global electricity production makes up 40% of primary energy, with transportation, heating, and industry accounting for the remaining 60%. This is figure one. We'll have a look here. Figure one, overview of global primary energy and electricity. So here's the, okay, here's electricity. You've got coal, Gas, nuclear, petroleum, other, wind and solar, approximately 8%. And here you've got the other for primary energy, industry, transport, heating and building. And then before losses, electricity. There you go. Heating and building. This this one here, this is why we've got energy ratings increasing in the construction code here in Queensland. 30000 a year, increased build cost. Awesome. 30000 per building in a year. You don't have to pay it every year, don't worry. So, current energy policy focuses on the electrification of energy, thus significantly increasing electricity's share of primary energy by using electricity more for transportation, EVs, heating, see heat pumps, and industry, see DRI, producing steel using hydrogen. Therefore, this paper focuses on electricity. For a more comprehensive discussion on transportation, the authors recommend Kaifer 2013, 21st Century Snake Oil. That includes details on hydrocarbons and biofuels for transportation, which are not covered here in in greater detail. Despite trillions of US dollars spent globally on the energy transition, the proportion of fossil fuels as part of total energy supply has been largely constant at around 80% since the 1970s when energy consumption was less than half as high. Also in Europe, fossil fuel shares share is still above 70%. Among other, uh, Koba et al. 2020, among others, confirm that total primary energy consumption more than doubled in the 40 years between 1978 and 2018. At the same time, energy intensity of GDP improved by a little less than 1%, cons- confirming Javon's paradox that energy efficiency improvements are always offset by higher energy demands. Variable renewables. I'd call them disposables, not renewables, but anyway. Variable renewables in the form of wind and solar, while not the subject of this paper, account for approximately 3% of global primary energy and 8% of global gross electricity production in 2019. And this was largely unchanged in 2020 and 2021, referred to 
Schönekal and Smith 21 for more details on solar. Other forms of energy supply usually categorized as renewables such as biomass, hydrogen, or sorry, hydro, geothermal or tidal power are not detailed further as they are not considered uh, variable and have a different quality. For comparison, coal and gas combined account for approximately 50% of global primary energy and 60% of global gross electricity production. Thus, fossil fuels still exceed wind and solar by a fossil to wind solar factor of 27 for primary energy and 8 for electricity powered production. Germany is the foremost industrialized nation in the move towards decarbonization and has invested at least 360 billion euros since 2000 in the energy transition, reducing the share of nuclear and fossil fuels. Well, and they've all started up all their coal power plants again, haven't they? Hmm. Funny that. It shall be noted that nuclear is the most energy efficient. See section 2 on EROI, energy return on invested, and least polluting way of producing electricity, but faces other challenges. However, as Europe has been reducing its production of fossil fuels, the continent's dependent, dependence on energy raw material imports increased significantly, mostly from Russia over the past two decades. With the money invested in the energy transition, until 2021, Germany has reached a wind solar share for gross electricity production, or sorry, gross electricity production of approximately 28%. The primary energy share of wind and solar, however, was still only 5%. To achieve this transition, Germany's installed power capacity had to double, figure two. Consequently, the renewable energy sector grossly underperformed compared to its investment in real energy terms, and Germany's electricity prices reached the highest among the G20. So if we have a look here, Germany, uh, German installed power capacity, electri electricity production, and primary energy. What do we have here? Uh, wind and solar. Um, oh, boy. So what is it, 12 to 100 and 122. So it's increased significantly. Total capacity is um, in Germany... Wind and solar, wind and solar, fuel, fossil fuel, uh, primary energy consumption, power generation. There you go, 28% for its investment. This underperformance, however, is due to the low capacity factor, low energy efficiency, and our other inherent shortcomings of variable renewable energy discussed herein. Figure three. Not due to bad implementation or bad intent. So here's figure three. The capacity factor, low capacity factors to decide characteristics resulting in intermittency and unpredictability of wind and solar, energy density, space requirement, low energy density, low availability of wind and solar irradiance per square meter. This results in large spaces required, increasing room costs, mm -hmm. low energy efficiency and resulting economic losses from power generation, conversion, conditioning and transmission, uh, correlated wind solar resources, Continent, continental sized areas of highly color, um, correlated wind speeds and solar availability. Short lifetime of wind and solar installations becoming shorter because of repowering. Yes, that's uh, uh, something we'll look at. You know, backup storage, critical requirement for an underutilization of backup power stations or long duration backup energy storage systems that need to essentially equal 100% of wind and, and solar installed capacity. This is the biggest concern. You have to build all this stuff, and that needs to be calculated into the energy investment. All the embodied energy in these bloody batteries, the energy that you use to mine, transport these materials, where you don't have that. The battery backup for coal and gas is under the ground, everyone. It's underground. I'll make sure we're getting the whole paper. There we go. So... During the 20 years from 2002 to 2021, Germany's installed power capacity almost doubled from 115 gigawatts to 222 gigawatts, while total electricity consumption was essentially flat and primary energy fell 
over 15%. Over the next decades, Germany expects a significant increase in electricity consumption for the electrification of transportation, heating, and industrial processes to satisfy increased demand from consumers and industry as required by, Ger- by the German energy energy Weiden, Wenden, energy Wenden. My Deutsch is ein bisschen schlecht. The global average looks slightly better. Of the total 2020 global installed energy capacity of 8,000 gigawatts or 8 terawatts, figure 10, 18% or 1.4, 1,500,000 we'll say, 1,400 gigawatts was wind and solar, which contributed approximately 18% to global electricity and 3% to primary electricity. After installation of almost of almost 200 gigawatts of solar PV in 2021, the world celebrated its first one terawatt of installed solar capacity. That's installed. It has to reach that. <laughs> and what's this figure 10? Let's have a look. Where's figure 10? I want to see figure 10. Figure, oh, figure 10 is right down the bottom. Okay, we'll jump down there. Come on. Figure 4, 7. There's figure 10. Okay, there you go. Where's solar? Wind and solar, the little one at the top there. Okay, it shows you. Figure two illustrates the substantial disconnect between installed capacity and generated electricity. It appears that in countries such as Germany, given the average capacity factors for wind and solar, a doubling in installed capacity will lead to less than one-third of electricity supply and less than 10% contribution to primary industry, primary energy. The reasons for this disconnect are multifold and impact the world of electricity in many ways. Figure 3 lists the shortcomings of variable renewable energy for electricity generation in the form of wind and solar, which explain the reasons for the apparent disconnect. These deficiencies of variable renewable energy can only partly be reduced through technological improvements. Despite the sun's immense power, the energy available per square meter from natural wind and solar resources are limited and too small to allow efficient energy generation at grid scale, low energy density. Additional negative effects of wind and solar on vegetation, local climate, animal life, seaways, bird bird flyways and bird bat and even insect populations must also be considered. These effects originate primarily from the required land, large land area. Technology advances will further increase net efficiencies of wind and solar installations. However, physical boundaries as described by the Betz law and Schlockler Quiser limit dismiss the possibility of tenfold improvements. There is no prospect of a paradigm shift in energy from PV or wind as is promised for quantum computing. One cannot compare energy with computing. They follow different laws. Figure 7. We'll look at that later. The 33% quant, uh, quantum efficiency Schockler uh, quiser limit can be, exe- can be exceeded with multi-layer PVs, which so far are unstable and less durable than silicon PV panels. Today, they already surpass monocrystal crystalline silicon's quantum efficiency by about 50%, but 20-year operational life for multi-layer PVs are not in reach. Technological improvements in new materials, such as perovskites and quantum dots, may overcome the stability and durability problems in time, but 100% quantum efficiency is the absolute physical ma- maximum that will never be reached. Thus, technological improvements may improve PV's quantum efficiencies by a factor of two, but not by the required multiple to compete with conventional energy generation and to surpass the required energy return on investment hurdle rate at grid scale. Be, nem- be reminiscent that also conventional energy generation improves its efficiency over time. So, part two, the literature review, and I'll have another shot of water here, guys.
Literature Review Methodology and Results, The Cost of Electricity and EROI. The authors have completed a total of over 70 interviews in Europe, Africa, Asia and North America during the past three years. Discussions have taken place at various ministries, economic, government organizations and universities and industry conglomerates. The overarching theme from these interviews was a lack of understanding of the true full cost of electricity and continued misuse of the marginal cost measure LCOE. And LCOE, if we go back here, it's the levelized cost of electricity. Okay. To compare costs of variable renewable energy with conventional sources of power. In all interviews, the overarching desire, especially in developing nations, was to support a sustainable yet economically viable energy policy to transition away from fossil fuels as fast as possible. The costs and downsides associated with such transition were rarely understood or researched. Let's read that again. This is 70 interviews, Europe, Africa, Asia, various ministries, economic, government organizations, universities, industries. The costs and downsides associated with such transitions were rarely understood or researched. Does that surprise you at all? Does that explain what we're hearing from our politicians? They don't give a shit about the detail. They probably don't even understand it or bother to look into it. They're just interested in the election results. The authors have contacted energy think tanks such as the IE. IEA, the IEEJ, and the ACE, Asian Center for Energy, and discuss some of the above topics in detail. The conclusions herein are also a result from these interchanges. The political components inherent in the work of at all of the mentioned organizations was removed and attention was put on the economic impacts of the proposed transition to VRE. The literature research is referenced as the specified as the at the specific element detailed in the paper the cost of electricity is important for a country's global competitiveness and a key element for economic development as well as the discussion on energy policy at large electricity systems are complex which is also driven by the fact that a functioning electricity system can only supply usable power if and only if electricity demands equal electricity supplies at all times Every second. So what's going to happen in Queensland if we've gotten rid of our coal plants and we need more than one day of backup power? (laughs) That's when the diesel pumps start going. This unique characteristic of electricity systems drives costs. We need to differentiate between costs, value and price, which are not the same. Further below, we discuss only cost. Cost, the resource and work required for production value the intrinsic value or utility to the consumer for a particular application as compared to its alternatives. And price, what consumers or the market are willing to pay. The price is influenced or distorted by government or company interventions such as laws, mandates, subsidies, geopolitics, and more. I guess uh, every Australian is familiar with that now. Housing market, aren't you guys? The true full cost of electricity, FCOE, is detailed in the following section. Cost of electricity has been studied in detail by several government organizations and universities. The full cost of electricity, denoted as FCE, was described in a number of white papers published at the University of Texas in 2018, UT, however focused on transmission and distribution, paying less attention to backup storage and the intermittency of VRE. Also, the lower asset utilization of backup systems is not discussed in greater detail. The OECD referenced, references the full cost of electricity sparingly between A, plant-level costs, B, grid-level system costs, and C, external or social costs outside the electricity system. The argument is that the full cost must include all three categories, which the authors agree with. The OECD study pays more attention to higher volatility and complexity with added VRE in the system. But for instance, energy required or cost for recycling is not considered. In the OECD's discussion on pollution and GHGs, 
the life cycle emission and non-emission impact of energy systems is not considered. The focus is on combustion operation and carbon dioxide. The study also only marginally considers resource and space consideration. On cost, the following OECD statements are important. When VREs increase the oh, sorry, when VREs increase the cost of the total system, they impose such technical externalities or social costs through increased balancing costs, more costly transport, transport and distribution networks, and the need for more costly residual systems to provide security of supply around the clock. From the point of view of economic theory, VREs should be taxed for these surplus costs, integrated costs above, in order to achieve their economically optimal deployment. Various other electricity cost metrics exist, such as the LCOE, VALCOE, LACE, LCOS, integration costs of VREs, etc. For a complete cost picture, the authorities introduce the full cost of electricity to society, FCOE. The author's FCOE falls into 10 different categories that illustrates its complexity and many are not easily measured. See figure 5. Okay, let's have a look at figure 5. There you go. The full cost of electricity to society. You've got the cost of building, cost of fuel, cost of operation, cost of transportation and balancing, cost of storage, cost of backup, Cost of emissions, cost of recycling, room costs, there you go, and the non-USD metrics, um, the EROI, the energy return on energy invested, the material input per unit of service, and the lifetime costs. So it seems like a very thorough way of assessing this. It's, that's why I like this. The authors have not yet found these 10 categories considered in full by Energy, Energy Economic Institute, government, university, private company, or any of the media. Usually only one or two categories are discussed, and levelized cost of electricity is erroneously used most often. The socio-economic and environmental benefits of understanding the methods for electricity cost determination are substantial and require further study. So, the full cost of electricity, FCOE. Since the question of electricity is one at society level, or at least a country level, the authors attempt to define the true full cost of electricity, FCOE. Ten cost categories determined what we refer to as the full cost of electricity to society. One, the cost of building. Uh, The cost of building electricity generation, processing equipment such as a solar panel, power plant, a mine, a gas well, or a refinery, often referred to as investment costs. Two, cost of fuel, such as oil, coal, gas, uranium, biomass, or wind, which is a zero cost of fuel. This would include processing, upgrading, and transporting the fuel through pipelines on vessels, rails, or trucks. It would also include costs for rehabilitating the source of the fuel, such as mines or wells. The levelized cost of energy often assumes that the price for CO2 is part of the cost of fuel. But to be correct, we define a separate category 7, cost of emissions. 3. Cost of operating and maintaining the electricity generation processing equipment. 4. Cost of electricity transportation and balancing systems to the end user, such as transmission grids, charging stations, load balancing, smart meters, other IT technology, and its increasing threat from cyber attack. That's topical. Refer to the BCG Guide to Cybersecurity and the March 2022 cyber attack on satellite infrastructure targeting German windmills. Well, that's that's one we'll have to look at in another video, guys. Cost of storage. If required, medium and long-term, different from load balancing. That should include cost of building and operating, for example, pumped hydrogen, batteries, sorry, pumped hydro, batteries, hydrogen, etc. Keep in mind that oil, coal, gas, uranium, and biomass are storage of energy in themselves. That's, that's what makes them so useful, everyone. 
A, the full cost of storage must include, just for storage alone, the cost of building, cost of operation, cost of emissions, cost of recycling, and 10 other metrics, MIPs, lifetime, energy return on energy investment. That's exactly what we need to highlight. The public needs to learn this. I know, I know this is going to be a long video, but I really think we need to go through this. Treat it like an audio book with a dodgy a dodgy uh, audio book reader <laughs> who keeps drinking coffee and butting in. Six, the cost of backup technology. Electricity systems include redundancy in case something happens to a power plant or equipment. All reliable electricity systems are over-designed, usually by 20% of the highest peak power demand. In addition, every single... VRE installation equipment such as wind and solar require 100% backup, storage, or combination of both, as by nature they are not dispatchable or predictable. That's the big point of contention here because the wind can stop everyone. It's that simple. Clouds can stop your solar production. So, B. Conventional power plants are often useful as a backup for variable renewable energy. The higher the share of VRE in the electricity system, the less such backup capacity will be used, causing lower asset utilization. Thus, the cost of backup increases logarithmically as the VRE share of the energy system increases beyond a certain point. C. Thus, backup capacity may and currently does substitute long-term storage and is included herein as a separate category since it has a different quality and cost. It is important to avoid double counting. Seven, cost of emissions. Includes the true cost, not arbitrary taxes or subsidies, of all airborne emissions from power generation technology along the entire value chain. This would include, but not be limited to, particular matters, um, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, as well as life cycle greenhouse gas, grasses, including from building and recycling the equipment. Benefits of CO2 because of its proven fertilization effects for all plant life would also be incorporated. For the cost of global warming, the authors refer to Nordhaus 2018, Lomborg 2020, and Kahn 2021. Eight, the cost of recycling. Decommissioning or rehabilitation of electricity generation and separately, as part of point six above, backup equipment after its lifetime expired. See also the hidden cost of solar energy published by Inseed and Harvard by at at, at Tusa 2021. That's an interesting one. How how much work would it be to rehabilitate a solar farm? Can't be easy. Nine, room cost, sometimes called land footprint and energy sprawl, is a new cost category relevant for low energy density renewable energy such as wind, solar, or biomass. Due to the low energy density per square meter of wind, solar, or biomass, they take up significantly more space than conventional energy generation installations where room costs tend to be negligible, at least relative to variable renewable energy. These larger space requirement, requirements negatively impact our environment and need to be considered. A. Room costs include direct costs and opportunity costs related to the larger space required and the impact on, i.e. see transportation routes, cropland, forests, urban areas, affected bird and animal life, changing wind and local climate, increases, increasing temperature, increasing water scarcity in uh, aridic areas and noise pollution. B. Climate and warming effects of large scale wind and solar installations are well documented but remain mostly ignored by the industry, policymakers, and investors. C. New coal, a new coal power plant in India would require about 2.8 square meters, uh, sorry, 2.8 square kilometers per 1 gigawatt installed capacity, plus the space for the coal mine. A new solar park would take about 17 square kilometers per one gigawatt of inst installed capacity, plus the space for mining the resources to build solar. One gigawatt installed, installed solar capacity would generate much less electricity due to solar's low capacity factor, 
adjusting for a 16.5 average Spanish solar capacity factor. This would translate to a comparable 93 square kilometers for solar or a multiple of 33 times compared to coal. Additional space is required for backup and or storage due to solar's intermittent nature. D. The room costs per installed megawatt of VRE increases the higher the installed capacity reaches. The reason has to do with reduced capacity factor for wind and large wind farms, see wake effect. As well, the reduced value of additional VREs beyond an optimal penetration level. 10. Other metrics. Three more elements of the full cost of electricity are metrics that are not measured in US dollars, but are important for environmental efficiency of electricity generation. None of these metrics are included in the levelized cost of energy. The material input per unit service, MIPS, measures the material or resource efficiency of building energy equipment in tons of raw material per megawatt capacity and per per megawatt hour produced electricity. MIPS for energy equipment thus measures an important element of environmental impact. The U.S. Department of Energy and the IEA document the high material input for renewable technology and capacity. See figure four. Do we have that here? Here we go. I mean, oh boy, here's the materials, the tons of TW, of terawatt. There's coal. There's gas. Gas is really, gas is underrated. It really is. There's nuclear. And there you go. There's hydro, solar, wind, and geothermal. Look at that. Look at look at, look at this steel in solar, hydro, a whole lot of concrete. I'm just going to have a shot of coffee while you uh, look at that one. Can you appreciate how this wouldn't be considered and how this will actually change the viability of a lot of these things? Because, I mean, look at the embodied energy. Concrete has pretty high embodied energy. And so does steel. Glass as well, copper. So, B, lifetime, measures how long the equipment is used before it is retired or replaced. We need to consider that repowering, or better, early replacement of wind and solar significantly reduces the designed lifetime. So, E, uh, C, energy return on investment, in a way summarizes a large portion of all measures mentioned above. E R R O I also accounts for the energy efficiency of building, operating, and recycling the equipment. It includes all embedded energy. An EROI of uh, 2 to 1 means investing 1 kilowatt hours in input energy for every 2 kilowatt hours of output energy. As per Weisbach et al. 2013, solar and biomass in Northern Europe have a buffered EROI of about 2 to 4. Nuclear has an EROI of 75, and coal and gas about 30. Roman culture, the most efficient pre-industrial civilization, reached an EROI, so energy return, on energy investment of 2 to 1. Much uncertainty remains about actual EROI values. Now that, that's the question. Are these variable renewables able to achieve our energy requirements for a modern civilization? Is the energy return on energy investment going to be worth it when we consider everything, the full cost of energy and electricity? That's what we need to consider. That's the question we should all be asking. The author emphasizes here that the full cost of electricity, FCOE to society, does not include taxes or subsidies, which in fact are arbitrary. Governments sometimes impose government set prices or taxes in an attempt to emulate such true costs or to support research and development. The FCOE will account for all true costs and therefore may not be the right metric for all investment decisions that do have to incorporate taxes, subsidies or prices rather than costs for certain elements. FCOE attempts to estimate the true cost to society that is relevant when estimating the global cost of energy transition to the global cost of any human-caused climatic changes. Therefore, fossil fuel subsidies are not included as a separate item. Neither are subsidies for wind and solar included. 
such as missing CO2 taxes, even though the production and recycling of solar, of solar and wind capacity and backup systems incur high relative CO2 per kilowatt hour. Please note that to date, CO2 or carbon taxes include only direct CO2 emissions from fuel combustion, leaving out life cycle emissions along the entire value chain, such as methane and other GHGs. That's, well, that shows you, doesn't it? 20, um, yep. Therefore, CO2 taxes are misleading and wrong, causing economic and environmentally undesired distortions such as the switch from coal to gas for climate reasons, dismissing the higher climate impact of methane emissions associated with gas and especially LNG production. From the above analysis, it can be concluded that levelized cost of electricity, LCOE, which only includes cost of building, one, cost of fuel, two, cost of operation, three, and sometimes certain CO2 taxes, part of cost of emission, seven, is not a reliable nor environmentally or economic, economically viable measure with which to evaluate different forms of energy generation at country or societal levels. Only FCOE includes all relevant economic and environmental costs from emissions and non-emissions through its true value, though its true value is difficult but not impossible to determine. Renowned energy think tanks such as the IEA, in France, the International Energy Economics Institute in Japan and the OECD or the U.S. Energy Information Agency have pointed out the incompleteness of levelized cost of energy multiple times. Yet the LCOE continues to be widely used despite its failings, usually without clear disclaimers and notes, even by the agencies themselves, by governments, banks, institutions, NGOs, companies, many scientists and the common press. It's We all know why, don't we? It's just all spin. Undesirable effects occur when conventional fuels and variable renewable energy, wind and solar, are mixed to provide a country's electricity. These effects would be measured would be measured completely by FCOE categories one to ten above. For instance, beyond a certain point, usually about a ten to twenty percent share. The cost of a na- to a nation's electricity system always increases with higher shares of variable renewable energy, VRE such as wind and solar. <laughs> We're seeing that now in Australia. The reason includes the reasons include, but are not limited to, the previously discussed differential energy dens- density and efficiency, intermittency and thus backup storage requirements, low capacity factors interconnection costs, material and energy costs, low energy return on investment, efficiency losses of backup capacity, room costs for the space space required, and plant animal life destroyed, recycling needs, and so forth. The IEA confirmed in December 2020, the system value of variable renewables such as wind and solar decreases as their share in the power supply increases. This would Also remain true if the price of renewable capacity, cost item one, cost of building, continue to reduce or even were to reach zero. For example, it doesn't change the conclusion even if the price of solar panels produced with coal power in China, partially using forced labor, reaches zero. This would also remain true if wind or solar technology would reach impossible 100% quantum efficiencies. The levelized cost of energy is inadequate to compare intermittent forms of energy generation and dis- with dispatchable ones, and therefore, when making energy policy decisions at a country or societal level. LCOE may, however, be used selectively to compare dispatchable generation methods with similar material and energy input, such as coal and gas. Using FCOE or the full cost of society, wind and solar are not cheaper than conventional power generation, and in fact become more expensive and high, the higher their penetration into the energy system. This is also illustrated by the high cost of the so-called green energy transition, especially to poorer nations. If wind and solar were truly cheaper in a free market economy, they would not require trillions of dollars of government funding or subsidies or laws to force their installation. That's the truth, isn't it? So, the energy return on energy invested. The authors 
suggest that environmental efficiency of energy is more complex than emissions alone, especially energy return on energy invested or energy return. The EROI, material input, lifetime, and recycling efficiency needed to, need to be considered as they determined other very important environmental and economic elements for evaluating electricity generation. The energy return on investment measures the energy efficiency of an energy gathering system. Higher EROI translates to lower environmental and economic costs, thus lowering prices and higher utility. Lower EROI translates to higher environmental and economic costs, thus higher prices and lower utility. When we use less input energy to produce the same output energy, our systems become environmentally and economically more viable. When we use relatively more input energy for each unit of output energy, we risk what is referred to as energy starvation. At an EROI of one or below, we are running a system at an energy deficit. So note, um, Bacal, Smil's Energy and Civilization and History, uh, Smil 2017, is an excellent, highly acclaimed book on the subject of energy. In addition, the authors recommend Kefa 2013, and Deloney et al. 2021 for more detailed discussions on EROI. Kiss et al. 2018 approached EROI by using gross energy ratio and the gross external energy ratios. Kiss et al. defined GER as the life cycle of energy return on investment and find a global average for GER of approximately 11 to 1. Due to the complexity of measuring energy return on energy investment, more research is required in harmonizing the approach for its determination. So, the energy return on investment is generally higher for wind than for solar, also driven by the higher advantage capacity factor. According to Kajal's Dale et al. 2014, the average solar PV from a net energy efficiency point of view can only afford one to three days of battery storage before the industry operates at an energy deficit. Wind, from a net energy efficiency point of view, can afford over 80 days of geological storage, 12 days of battery storage. However, for the, mention, for the mentioned net energy efficiency calculations, the researchers made the simplif- simplifying yet unrealistically generous assumption that a generation technology is supplied with enough energy flow, either wind or sunlight, to deliver 24 hours of average electricity power output every day. Well, we had a look today. When I'm recording this, it's not happening. This means days or weeks with no sun or wind would multiply the storage requirement and therefore further diminish the net energy efficiency, or EROI. Carbajal's Dale et al. included the, the proportion of electricity output consumed in manufacturing and deploying new capacity. It can be concluded that wind and solar have a very low EROI, and are therefore a step backwards in historic in history in terms of system energy efficiency. Their grid-scale employment risks energy starvation and is therefore not desirable economically nor environmentally. The authors would like to point out that for certain applications, heating a pool that is not connected to the grid or heating water for personal use in remote areas, solar and wind may be a desirable complement to our energy systems. The installation of wind and solar does reduce the amount of fossil fuels combusted, assuming no increase in power demand, which is the only positive of their employment. This positive aspect comes at high costs, summarized, illustrated in Figure 3, the summary of the shortcomings of variable renewable energy for electricity generation. The Industrial Revolution reduced humanity's dependency on biomass, hydro, and wind based on the, the newfound high EROI coal energy. This energy revolution allowed for the dramatic increase in standards of living, industrialization, decrease in heavy human labor, and abandonment of slavery. This revolution and its positive impact on human life was only possible to a drastic increase in energy availability, energy efficiency, or EROI. The energy revolution came with a diversification away from biomass burning towards fossil fuels, hydro, and later nuclear. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, human development peaked during the Roman Empire at an estimated sustained EROI of around 2 to 1. We can see that in figure 6, 
we have a look here. There's the Romans. During the 20th century, petroleum's high EROI, higher energy density, and versatility enabled the transportation revolution with cars, aircraft, and rockets. To appreciate the magnitude of this energy revolution, consider that three tablespoons of crude oil contain the equivalent of eight hours of human labor. Figure 6 systematically illustrates the concept of EROI in today's electricity systems and the impact of CCUS or hydrogen storage on energy efficiencies. So if we have a look here, where's that figure 6? Um, here's CCUS, here's coal and gas, only from excess or underutilized renewables for hydrogen. Okay, well, we'll see. Um, there's nuclear. Look at that. The full cost of electricity. It's hydro, coal, wind, and solar. Minimum EROI from bond society is 6 to 10. And this is the big concern. That wind and solar don't reach the minimum required for a modern society. Just, just bear that in mind. How much of the biomass renewable power that's generated by burning timber we're going backwards. So, Dr. Ian Mounds, 2016, based on Kiffer's work, explains EROI and points out that modern life requires a minimum EROI of 5 to 7, while most solar and many wind installations depend on, lo on location, have a lower EROI and are therefore inherently energy insufficient to support society at large. As per Weisbach et al. 2013, solar and biomass in Northern Europe have a buffer EROI of about 2 to 4. Keffer defines the net energy cliff, which demonstrates how, with declining EROI, society would commit even larger amounts of available energy to energy gathering activities. One example is employment. Below an EROI of 5 to 7, such great number of people would be working for energy gathering industries that there would not be enough people left to fill all other positions our current altruistic society requires. Some, however, may argue that this is desirable due to, due to artificial intelligence's long-term threat to human labor. The IEA's recent World Energy Outlook confirmed that global employment would rise from renewable energy systems, therefore providing evidence for the lower EOROI of renewable technologies. McKinsey, 2018, they're not considering the EROI concept, argues that automation will replace low-level workers. This trend is already well underway. Those without higher technical and intellectual skills may become unemployable in the future. In essence, McKinsey does not seem to see a problem with a higher, unemployment, higher employment in energy-related industries. So are we all going to get people walking in, in timber treadmills? Go real old school. The principle of energy return on investment, EROI, is at the core of society's energy efficiency, which is at the core of humanity's development and survival. So, point 2.3, the second law of thermodynamics impact on energy systems. The preface also introduced the first and second law of thermodynamics. Figure 7 tries to summarize the law's function. The first law is, is simple as it basically states that energy can never be lost, only be converted from one form to another. The second law introduces the concept of entropy, another word for usefulness or value of energy. High entropy, high disorder, or low value of energy. Essentially, the second law explains why, in a natural state, heat always moves from warm to cold, and not the other way around. When energy is converted from one form to another, entropy always increases, or useful energy is lost. The logical conclusion for our modern energy system is that we need to avoid conversion and storage of energy as well as complexity in our energy systems as much as possible, as all of this results in loss of useful energy. So generating a whole lot of energy to pump water from the lower reserve up to the high reserve just to run it back again, that's all energy lost. Okay. The loss of useful energy is important because it directly translates into reduced system energy efficiency 
it directly results in lowering the EROI when we convert wind power to hydrogen, when we store hydrogen, when we convert hydrogen back to power. It also directly results in warming of our biosphere. Of course. Going back to high school physics here. The net efficiency of a gas or coal-flowered power plant is also the result of this second law of thermodynamics. Every process that takes place in the boiler, the turbine, or the generator costs energy that is lost in a form of low-value heat to our surroundings. We established in Chapter 2 that that the green energy transition towards variable renewable energy in form of wind and solar will substantially increase the cost of electricity. The rise in cost will primarily burden poorer people and developing nations. Mackenzie and Mackenzie, (laughs) 22. With the concept of the second law of thermodynamics, we can now demonstrate part of the reason why the green energy transition will increase global energy inefficiencies because they require more complex energy systems and increased storage. The IEA summarized the the issue of increasing complexity in their article, Energy Transitions Require Innovation in Power Systems Planning, as follows. Shifting away from centralized thermal power plants as the main providers of electricity makes power systems more complex. Multiple services are needed to maintain secure electricity supply. In addition to supplying enough energy, these include making peak capacity requirements, keeping the power system stable during short-term disturbances, and having enough flexibility to ramp up and down in response to changes in supply and demand. More importantly, the first law of thermodynamics proves that most of our produced and consumed energy will end up in low-value or high-entropy heat and thus warms our biosphere, adding to measure, measured temperature increases. The author notes that there is also embedded energy in the products that we produce that is not released in forms of heat. These products are primarily used for housing or end up being consumables. The well-documented heat island effect is also a manifestation of the heat emitted from our energy systems to our surroundings. When we produce energy from sources such as nuclear, oil, coal, gas, or even geothermal, then we take energy that is inside our planet and in the end convert it to low-value heating, warming our biosphere. When we use energy from solar radiation by employing photovoltaics, we will not net warm our planet only if we disregard the warming from solar panels absorption and shifting atmospheric circulation, and if we disregard the energy for building and recycling the equipment of systems required to extract and use solar energy. Taking the energy from wind has additional climatic warming consequences, as detailed by Miller and Keith, 2018. High CO2 emitting forms of producing energy such as coal or gas partially offset the warming of the biosphere through CO2-driven fertilization and greening that can reduce solar warming. Solar radiation can only do one thing, grow a plant or warm the earth. Now that's, that's the first time I've heard of that. Three, discussion. Projected future of energy and suggestions for a revised energy policy. To allow for a clean energy transition, the Boston Consulting Group, BCG 2021B, projects global wind and solar power capacity to increase similar to Germany's past 20-year overbuilding. See figure 2 and figure 9. 2020 global power generation capacity totaled 8,000 gigawatts, of which 1.4 or 1,400 were wind and solar. In eight years' time, at the time of writing, by 2030, BCG projects that wind and solar alone will have reached 8.6 gigawatts, doubling today's entire global electricity capacity, the same as what happened in Germany from 2002 until 2021. Based on 2021 Arena Outlook data, BCG forecasts also forecasts that global wind and solar installed capacity must reach 22,000 gigawatts by 2050, almost quadrupling today's entire 
global electricity generation capacity. It is the author's opinion that these nameplate capacities will not be reached as the world would run out of energy, raw materials, and money before it happens. And if they were reached, the economic and environmental impact to society would be distressing, as explained in this paper. Such dramatic expansion of wind and solar will result in more fragile and expensive energy systems. It will also negatively impact the environment. Space requirements, backup, material input, EROI, recycling needs and local climate impacts. Offsetting any desired, entirely modelled, positive effect on the global climate from GHG emissions reductions. On the positive side, in the author's view, the only positive aspect such expansion will limit the use of fossil raw materials mined. The question is, however, if it would truly reduce total raw mineral use when honestly and truly accounting for the entire life cycle from resource mining, biomaterial transportation, processing, manufacturing and operation to recycling. Further research is required here. The concern is why hasn't this research already been done since we're spending billions upon billions of dollars on chasing this dream. After having arisen from approximately 2 billion to 8 billion in the past 100 years, the UN projects that global population will rise further from currently 8 billion to 10 billion until 2050. Population may peak around 11 to 12 billion by the end of the century. Despite continued improvements in energy efficiencies, rising living standards in developing nations, a forecast to increase global average annual per capita energy consumption from 21,000 kilowatt hours to 25,000 kilowatt hours by 2015, Lomborg 2020 and BP 2019. As a result, and as illustrated in figure 10, global primary energy consumption could rise by up to 50% by 2050. A 25% population increase, 20% PE per capita increase translates to 50% PE demand. Energy demand growth is fueled by developing nations in Asia, Africa, and South America. Developed nations are expected to consume less energy in the decades to come, driven by population declines, stagnation, and efficiency increases. However, historically, energy efficiency improvements have always increased energy demand. To illustrate, please refer to the author's recommended book, Life After Google, explaining the increased requirements for energy for global computing. <clears throat> the author reiterated that recent models by McKinsey estimate that global primary energy demand will only increase by 14% by 2050, while IEA's 2021 net zero pathway models a reduction by 10, approximately 10% in primary energy by 2030 in eight years from writing of this paper, although this is questioned by the energy industry and the authors. Yes. The same report estimates that global electricity generation will almost double from 2020 to 2050, also driven by the projected electrification of transportation. The Institute for Energy Economics in Japan predicts global primary energy demand to increase by 30% by 2050, while the American EIA predicts a 50% increase. Choba et al. 2020 compare various energy scenarios and point out that essentially all energy scenarios assume a decoupling of economic growth and energy consumption in the future. So they're incorrect then. Or they, they're, they're going against the all historical precedent. Growth in electricity demand will surpass primary energy growth, partly due to the global electrification of operations. Electricity share of primary energy will also increase because our lives become more computerized and gadgetized. Electricity is also planned to replace significant non-electricity energy consumption for transportation, heating, and industry. Despite hope for technology improvements, it is, a, it is a prudent assumption that wind and solar alone will not be able to generate enough total electricity to match the expected demand increase from 2020 to 2050. This is confirmed by the IEEJ's 2021 forecasting an absolute increase in fossil fuel share in primary energy in its reference case by 2050. In 2021, the IEA confirmed that renewables are expected to be able to serve only around half of the projected growth in global electricity demand 
in 21 and 22. <clears throat> For primary energy growth, the renewable share will only will be only a fraction, perhaps 20%. As today, about two-fifths of primary energy is consumed in electricity production. Even if wind and solar were to fulfill all future increases in primary energy demand, it becomes evident that for the next 30 years and beyond, we will continue to depend on conventional energy resources for a large portion, if not the vast majority, of our global energy needs. For recent net zero pathways and scenarios to succeed on paper, they require a number of highly optimistic, often unrealistic, assumptions related to rapid advancements in technology development. Hydrogen, penetration, demand curtailments, hmm, demand curtailments, you know what that means. <laughs> That's taxes, okay? That's taxes, guys. Raw materials with controlled, controllable prices and supply availability and so forth. They also largely dismiss EROI, material inputs, lifetime and realistic recycling assumptions, and thus renewables, negative economic and environmental impact. Four, conclusion and future research, the future energy policy. Energy policy is of utmost, utmost importance and has three objectives. One, security of supply, affordability of supply, and environmental projection, protection. Today's energy policy, however, focuses primarily on reducing anthropogenic human-caused energy CO2 emissions to limit or reduce future global warming. As demonstrated by Glasgow's COP26 meeting results, for November 2021, including but not limited to the Global Call to Clean Power Transition Statement. Many nations' energy policy decisions today pay less attention on objectives one and two, and even most aspects of three, such as plant and animal life, land space use, material and energy input, recycling efficiencies. The 2022 Russia-Ukraine crisis has put new focus on energy security, at least in Europe, which to a large extent has relied on Russian energy raw material supply <clears throat> and spent 20 years reducing its own energy independence. See Germany's political decision to abandon coal and nuclear and the EU's extensive investment to, divert, to divest from reliable fossil fuels energy sources. This new focus, however, seems rather ad hoc than strategic. The objective of global investments in the energy transition should be to meet all three primary goals of energy policy, not only one sub-goal, to reduce human energy CO2 emissions. Today's misguided energy investment focus on wind and solar increases the risk of energy starvation with all its consequences. The full cost of electricity, FCOE and EROI, illustrates that wind and solar are unfortunately not the solution to humanity's energy problems. At grid scale they will lead to undesirable economic and environmental outcomes. The use of levelized costs of, of energy for the purpose of discussing the green energy transition must cease because it continues to mislead decision makers. Governments, industries, and educational institutions are urgently encouraged to spend additional time on learning and discussing energy economic realities before forcing the basis of today's existence away from proven and relatively affordable energy systems. It takes only energy to solve the food and water crisis. It takes only energy to withstand natural disasters. It takes only energy to eradicate poverty. It must be understood that the dramatic planned increase in installed solar and wind capacity as detailed in Figure 9 has one advantage. It reduces the amount of required fossil or nuclear fuel consumed assuming no increase in power demand. However, this one advantage comes at significant cost to our environment and economies that have been detailed herein. The cost to the environment originated from the intermittency and inherently low ERI of VREs when considered the entire value chain and life cycle in Figure 11. The new energy revolution is a point in time where humanity can sustainably wean off fossil fuels, such new energy systems may be completely new, possibly a combination of fusion or fission, solar, geothermal, or most likely some unknown sci-fi energy source. It would also likely harness the power of the nuclear force, the power of our planetary systems, and the energy from within our planet. It will have little to do with today's wind and photovoltaic technologies due to the physical limits of energy density 
or energy available per square meter and intermittency. The authors suggest that to reach this new energy revolution, more must be invested in education and base research. Just as important is the second suggestion for continued simultaneous investment in conventional energy to make it more efficient and environmentally friendly. It must be noted, however, that non-CO2 emitting forms of energy generation will have no heat offset in the form of greening and fertilizing CO2. The reduced energy efficiency of VRE and the increased generation of energy from non-fossil origins will logically cause an increase in low-value or high-entropy heat that will continue to warm our planet even if no GHGs were emitted. The author suggests that future research and development should concentrate on understanding the true EROI of energy systems to aid prioritization and on reducing emissions and non-emissions environmental impacts of existing energy systems. Further research should detail and quantify FCOE and EROI for conventional and variable renewable energy systems. This work requires funding, a large team, and will be a global effort. To further optimize conventional energy systems, the author suggests that ultra-supercritical power plants and heli technologies should be further researched and implemented for increasing their efficiencies. The USC technology would have an immediate positive effect on nature at significantly lower costs than installing grid-scale variable renewable energy systems that will require backup. Investment in non in investment in not divestment from fossil fuels is the logical conclusion not only to eradicate energy poverty, improve environmental and economic efficiency of fossil fuels installed capacity, where it be for transportation, heating or generating electricity, but also to avoid a prolonged energy crisis that started in the second half of 2021. And here is the appendix, energy shortages, impacts and causes. <clears throat> so, the apparent energy shortage in Europe and other parts of the world starting in 21 illustrates the FCOE and the explained high cost of variable renewable energy. The lack of investment in conventional forms of energy resulted in undersupply, while at the same time wind and solar were not able to satisfy increased demand. Germany's highest consumer power prices of the industrialized nations is further evidence of FCOE and thus also driven by relatively high penetration of VREs. BCG and IEF, International Energy Forum, warned in the December 2020 energy report oil and gas investment in the new risk environment that by 2030 investment levels in oil and gas will need to rise by at least $225 billion from 2020 levels to starve off an energy crisis. The press started to pick up this subject in the third quarter of 2021 when energy resources and electricity prices started to soar. The first signs of a global energy shortage surfaced. Investment in coal are pro rata lower than in oil and gas. In 2022, uh, sorry, the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine also illustrated the fragility of global energy systems and how interweaned energy and politics are, especially when it comes to oil, gas, and nuclear. Of the dispatchable forms of energy, coal, hydro, geothermal energy are the least political. Below, a list of selected press articles at the topic of the new energy crisis for links to see the footnote. Okay, well, we might go through those in another video. Uh, you've got um, chief commodities, the global economy is facing energy starvation. This war will have many long-term consequences. The worst energy crisis since 73 anti-poverty organizations, the 2021 global energy crisis is ongoing shortages. Yes. Um, the human and economic costs from shortages of in electricity supply are apparent from several examples worldwide. A European example includes the 28th of September 2003 Italian power outages. That day, the north of Italy experienced up to three-hour outage and the south of Sicily, uh, Sicily 16 hours, a loss of 200 Gigawatt hours to consumer uh, to customers resulted in an estimated one to one point two billion euro economic loss. Barua summarizes in developing regions such as sub-Saharan Africa, shortages in electricity supply impede business and economic growth. In advanced economy, failure 
in the power grid and generating capacity has led to measurable economic losses, such as those seen in Italy in recent years. Another, another direct impact of electricity outages will be the loss of human lives and health. It must be noted that none of the net zero models or scenarios account for any cost resulting from energy shortages or starvations. That's concerning. We've also shown that the energy transition to variable renewable forms of energy, such as wind and solar, will result in higher electricity costs. Energy transition supporting strategy consultant McKinsey 2022 summarizes, a net zero transition would have a significant and often front-loaded effect on demand, capital allocation, costs, and jobs. Research shows that a rise in electricity prices impacts economic output. Barua Year 2019 summarized the impact of rising electricity costs to industries in China, US, Russia, Mexico, Turkey, and Europe based on scientific research. The coefficients of the coefficients of elasticity between economic output and electricity prices were irrefutably negative. So that means higher prices for electricity, output goes down. This basic economics here, guys. This is why all the Australians who are calling for manufacturing need to realize you're not going to do it with VREs. Not in our country. Output declined faster in the non-metallic minerals, cement sector, metal smelting and processing, chemical industry, and mining and metal production. For example, in Vietnam, impacts of an increase in electricity tariff on the long-running marginal cost of of products manufactured using electricity-intensive processes were examined in 2008. An increase in tariffs drove price inflation of all affected goods and services. That's You've got to remember that. This push to VREs is going to result in inflation of not just electricity, but of everything. Everything. So, uh, Baruna, I mispronounced that, 2019, uh, continues and confirms the author's analysis how the retirement of fossil fuel power plants without adequate, reliable, and affordable alternatives will reduce the amount of backup power to less than the amount required to meet capacity shortages during peak electricity demand. Developing and industrialized nations such as India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Pakistan will be negatively affected by the cessation of funding from Western financial institutions. Alternative funding may lead to the adoption of less efficient generating technologies, resulting in increased environmental burden. Consequently, industrializing countries that do not invest in high-efficiency, low-emission conventional forms or conventional fuel technologies could face higher costs of generation, higher emissions reducing their competitiveness, and as a result, slowing economic growth. This could have generations of damage. If investment in fossil fuels will not increase substantially and very soon a very prolonged Global energy crisis will be difficult to avoid this decade. This remains true even if all sustainable go- sustainability goals are achieved and wind and solar capacity continue to increase as planned or hoped. Global energy markets during the 2021 COVID recovery in Europe and Asia and the Russia-Ukrainian war in 22 are testament, testimonies to the impact of energy shortages. The author refers to Kefir's 2013 and reiterate that oil coal, gas, and uranium are the primary energy sources that nourish rather than starve governments and economies. A true primary energy source, like a true food source, need not be subsidized. It must must by definition yield many times more energy and wealth than it consumes, or else it is a sink, not a source. It is not by subsidies, but rather by the merits of EROI, material efficiencies, and energy density, and in spite of heavy taxation and fierce competition with other energy alternatives that oil, coal, gas, and nuclear have grown to dominate the global energy economy by over 80%. And here we have the references, guys. And this, I know, is a very, very long video. But, uh, well, let's have a bit of a, a talk summary here. Wait. Hang on. I got a merch. Wait, there we go. I, I've I've got to have a, a sip of my coffee, guys. My water. Now, I know this is really long. 
And let me know in the comments if you've actually managed to get through the whole thing. I will put a link to this paper in the comments below. Uh, you can find it available online. I highly recommend you share it with people. The reason why I wanted to go through this is because it hit, hits the nail on a lot of issues and concerns I've had with this constant push for variable renewable technology. In, it's, the problem is it's a, a big construction project and there's a whole lot of complexities involved in this and you'll have people that will simply be jumping on this bandwagon for purely ideological purposes and not understand the true impact of what they're having. They're pushing for these VREs or disposable renewable energy generation that is going to have a net negative impact and it isn't going to all be roses and it is going to pull us backwards. Here in Queensland, I want to look at this proposal that the state government has has put forward for their strong push for VREs and the investment in hydrogen, uh, hydro storage, hydro pump storage. Now, it all sounds good, but I'll reach out and I'll see what methodology they have used to assess the viability of these. I'd bet you a carton they haven't done it as thorough as this modeling. It's all done for political purposes. That's why people need to be educated. People need to learn and understand the reality of what's being proposed. So that's why the full cost of electricity is very important or else we're going to go, we're going to be stepping backwards. We'll have inflation. You'll have energy starvation. You won't be able to depend on the energy grid anymore. It'll just become something for the elite to have. And our quality of life will go down. What do you reckon? Anyway, let me know your thoughts and opinions. And did you learn something from this paper? Is it the first time you've been introduced to some of these concepts? I think we need to spread them out further and get more people discussing. And also let me know if you don't mind these long-form videos or if I should stick to the shorter ones. Because these are exhausting. <laughs> I think, what is it going to be? Oh, hang on. Not an hour and a half. No, not quite. Oh, wait. Yep, it will be. <laughs> anyway. Take care, guys. Thank you for watching. Check out my other channels, Heiser Bim and Heiser Says International. I actually put a new video for Heiser Bim out recently. Check it out. A new uh, Epic and Autodesk are doing something exciting. And if you want to support the channel and the content I find and discuss, there are a few ways you can financially on YouTube or Patreon. You can use our referral links from Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or Aussie Broadband. Buy our pocket squares or call us if you need an architect. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. And thank you. If you manage to stick through the whole video, it does wonders for the view time on the channel. Cheers. I'm tired. <laughs>